Welcome everyone to the Daniel Kurgan Associates Wealth Management Review for September 24th, 2020. Today's presentation is titled Markets and Elections. My name is Rocky Istvan. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer and Associate Wealth Manager at Daniel Krugan Associates. Daniel Krug will be joining me. He is the CEO and Senior Wealth Manager at Daniel Krug & Associates. I will remind you that this presentation is for informational and illustrative purposes only. It is not a solicitation and should not be considered investment or tax advice. If you have any questions, please give us a call in the office and we'll set an appointment to help you get those answers. We're looking at about 35 minutes today for our presentation. This session will be recorded and available on YouTube later for anybody that wants to review it or couldn't make it at this time. Everyone will be muted on this. However, you can use the chat room and type in any questions on the right side of your screen or just to say hi. We want to thank both CNR, City National Rockdale, and the Capital Group for their contribution to the data that we're presenting today. And I'm going to pop on and say hi to everybody. It's good to see you guys. Uh, glad to have you on board. Uh, just a reminder what wealth management means to us. Your overall investment strategy is at the core of everything that we do. It's the foundation for managing wealth. And that's important. And just about every firm out there does some form of investment consulting. Some does it better than others. However, where we differentiate ourselves is in the area of advanced planning, and I'm going to shrink myself down here a little bit so that I don't cover up everything. There we go. Those advanced planning areas are wealth enhancement, and you can see the different uh, strategies we've worked on under wealth enhancement, wealth transfer, wealth protection, and about a third of our clients are charitably inclined, so we have many strategies that can improve your tax and gifting situation with charitable giving. Agenda for this week is we're going to go over some of the major developments that have taken place, an update on COVID, the impact of elections on the market, the market itself and where it's at, opportunities and strategies, and we'll leave time for answering any questions that you may have at the end. So let's go on to major developments. Okay, major developments this week. COVID trends are still moving in the right direction. However, schools are, have started up and there's been a lot of difficulties with that and different approaches to how to deal with education. And uh, that's still going to be, um, I think, an issue moving forward as these schools are trying to get the job done in educating students. 48 out of 50 states really have a very low transmission rate. That means that basically um, a rate of below one means that a person that already has the virus has a very small possibility to transmitting it to less than one person, um, which is good. Finally, we're getting there, and that's due to um, how we're handling it. Europe, the COVID flare-ups that we've seen have not significantly impacted fatality. So there, you know, there's been an increase in positive tests in Europe yet the amount of fatalities and even hospitalizations have stayed relatively flat and low. So that is not increasing. Healthcare treatments improve COVID outcomes. So a lot of things that we've learned is being implemented at, you know, at the doctor's offices and we're finding lower severity and fatality rates. The vaccine progress continues. There's going to be an issue though, we believe, with just having the infrastructure in place to be able to distribute that vaccine and get it to where it's needed most and the quickest. So um, that will probably be an issue as those vaccines become online. And consumer spending data has improved in September. So that's a positive that we're seeing. There was a little bit of a pause at the end of the summer, but it is moving forward and believe that that's going to continue throughout the rest of the year. Market volatility. We've seen some volatility this week and beginning the end of last week. So it again is because valuations are very high. We're going to touch on that um, in a little bit. So when you have high valuations, littler th things can impact the market. 
the economic fundamentals though do continue to improve when you're looking at the underlying fundamentals of, of the economy. It has slowed since the uh, second quarter. However, it is still, um, the economy is still growing. Consumer confidence is remaining low um, because we've had some business startups, especially in the Southwest, and then they've had to slow that down. But uh, business optimism is improving. Inflation is not a concern. The Fed keeps uh, coming out and updating their estimation on the economy and what needs to be done from uh, Fed policies. And they see no reason to change interest rates for um, one to three years. So it's give us a level playing field, a known factor out there so businesses can borrow and take advantage of low rates and uh, get capital moving. Our investment strategies have been focusing on high quality companies at appropriate relative valuations. Um, in this type of uh, market, when we've got this kind of volatility and we've got these issues where some businesses are going out of business, others are actually growing at um, faster than normal rates, being able to select those industries, those sectors, those companies that are gonna profit and stay away from those that are not um, is very, very important and keeping the valuation of that company in line with uh, what you're paying for the stock. So um, that's one of our biggest things that we're focused on right now, along with the money managers going into the end of this year. The US economy and the emerging market Asia is recovering faster than Europe and other regions. So I'm gonna pop back on here and I'm also going to invite Dan to come on board and join me. There's Dan and give us an update on COVID. So Dan, if you want to take over. Absolutely. And good morning, everyone. Interesting things developing out there, but uh, it'll, it'll be cool to see really just where we're going with the uh, numbers. Um, I would like to say this, when it comes to the COVID uh, updates that we give, uh, I'd like to kind of explain one of the reasons why we keep bringing this up, because when you're looking at uh, how COVID is affecting the economy, it's also reflecting into what's going on with the market. So the more we understand where we are in this COVID battle, uh, the better we understand what we need to do moving forward for our clients from a investment strategy standpoint and from an advanced planning standpoint. So yeah, it's something that we feel is important uh, to let you at least understand what we're seeing out there. Um, you know, we do understand the need that clients have for information and we wanna make sure that we get you the accurate information. Uh, we also understand there's a lot of fear out there um, and, you know, when you think about fear, the, a lot of it's propagated by the news. A lot of it's just the unknown, right? What we don't know kind of can, can put us a little uneasy. Our job is to give you as much information so you can actually relax and understand what's going on out there. Uh, and, and through that relaxed nature, actually have victory in everything that, uh, that you want to accomplish from a wealth management standpoint. So we're gonna take a look at the nuts and bolts of this and really kind of put it together for you. Uh, so here's what we have. We're gonna start with Michigan. Why do we start with Michigan? Well, because that's where most of our clients are or at least are from. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at where we're at. So on this slide, we show the, the map of Michigan. It's kind of broken down into eight different regions and each one of those regions uh, are designated by a risk level. Now, if anybody knows uh, Brenta Hunter from Hunter CPA, she loves purple and she would just love the fact that the state of Michigan went from the red and yellow uh, map colors to the purple map colors. Uh, one of the reasons was is they thought it was conflicting with some of the other maps that they were working with. But uh, here's what we have. We've got six different stages. They run from uncontrolled growth down to post pandemic. In other words, we're open back up again. Uh, but the criteria for opening still is not clear. I think we have a better understanding, but it's still not uh, fully clear as to when we're actually gonna get to that post pandemic state. So let's take a look at some of the numbers. 
First of all, Michigan statewide daily tests over time. If you go back to April 1st, uh, we were a seven day average testing of just shy of 4,000 uh, a day on average. If you fast forward to today, now we have about 29,000 testings that are being done. That's our seven day average. So that's about 7.4 times more than we had uh, back in April. So as you can imagine, with more tests are gonna come more people being diagnosed. So here's, here's where we are. So the Michigan statewide positive test rate over time has actually dropped 92% from April 1st. I mean, that's huge right there. April 1st, we were at 34.8. Now, why was that? Well, because the test rate was much lower at that time. So the number of people being tested was lower and it was more the people that absolutely had the virus. It, uh, I mean, or at least the conditions that, that made you think they had the virus to be tested. Again, fast forward today, we're down to 3.2% positive test rate uh, again, because we have so many people being tested, there's a lot of people that just aren't sick. Uh, so more than just the sick are being tested. Now we go on to the cases per million over time. Uh, this number again, go back to April was uh, 128 uh, that were being tested. Now we're at 47.9 is what the seven day average is. And again, this is the cases per million over time. Uh, and when you think about it uh, on 919 testing, it's up 9.2 times the amount we had in April. So uh, things are going in the right direction there as well. Now, this is probably the most important number, the Michigan statewide death over time. Uh, in April, our average was 172. Uh, two weeks, well actually, Four weeks ago when I did this uh, update, we were at a seven day average of eight deaths. Now we're down to six. So as you can see, things are getting much, much better. We've actually plateaued uh, since the beginning of July. Uh, things are looking, looking quite up right there. Now let's take a look at the recap again. This is very positive stuff for the state of Michigan. Now, what I'm a little concerned about or, or confused about is why we're stepping backwards and not moving forward in the risk levels. So if you think about it, the testing is robust at 29K daily average. So that's again, 7.4 times greater than it was in April. The positive test rate is down to 3.2, so that's a 92% drop in positive tests. The average new cases, the seven day average is at 47.9, down 63%. And then the average death daily is six, down 96.5% from the April numbers. So uh, my hat's off, quite frankly, to the health professionals because they're doing a great job of keeping this under control. We know a lot more about the virus now than we did before. The hospitals are uh, fully capable to be able to take care of the patients. Um, so again, hats off to all the healthcare professionals and everybody that is helping to get this under control. Uh, again, when you look at the decision to open, uh, what it appears is that it is about positive test rates, not number of deaths. Uh, but as you could see in the numbers, the positive test rates are coming down to a level that is really containing uh, from what I'm seeing. So I, I'm, I'm not sure why we're not opening up. But the sooner we get the ability to open up, the sooner our economy will start moving. Now, the state of Michigan isn't that much different than the rest of the countries out there. Now, when you look at U.S. and Europe, uh, the U.S. again is doing much better. The cases and hospitalizations are continually going down. 90% uh, of the U.S. population is below a transmission rate of one. And as Rocky had pointed out, 
anything below one, you're going to see a decrease in numbers. So it's not exponentially uh, expanding on us. It's going the other direction. That's good. The average fatalities are less than a thousand over a seven day, really for the last month uh, for the first time. So that's a good thing. The cases in Texas and Florida have dropped dramatically. And I just want to point something out again. You will have some trends up and down over time just due to different states opening, pulling back, opening back up again. Uh, the ebbs and flows would be a natural progression in opening up our country. Let's go on to Europe. Uh, Rocky, I mentioned it earlier. Europe's reported cases are up, but very much like Michigan, there is little increase in the fatalities. So yes, there's, there's more people being confirmed. One of the reasons is, is because they are testing a whole lot more over there than they were back in April. So as you would expect, you would see more confirmed cases. Now these could be people that have had it already, not just people who are currently going through the healing process relative to it. But again, the fatalities have kind of leveled off, which uh, is a very positive first step here to reopening actually the world. So um, if you think about the next step, the next step really is the vaccine. And uh, the current administration has dubbed getting the vaccine out there, Operation Warp Speed. Uh, and certainly they are moving rather fast to get a vaccine in place. Um, I, I, I think that's awesome. Uh, there is a question out there as to how many people who will actually take the vaccine. You know, the, the, the studies that we've seen or the polls we've seen so far are saying about 50% of the people would take it and 50% are saying, no, I'm not gonna take the vaccine. Uh, some just by nature of they just don't do vaccines in the first place, but others could be that they're just not sure about the vaccine yet. Uh, so time will tell on that, but here's some good news. Uh, at the end of the day, Right now, what the studies are showing is that we've got about 15 to 20% herd immunity at this point. Now, if you listen to any of the studies, you would, you would hear that they wanna see us above 60%. Well, if 50% of the country actually gets the vaccine, that could very well put us over that 60% mark, which would put us into clean sailing uh, or relative clean sailing moving into 2021, which is obviously very good for the economy, very good for the market as a whole. That brings us to the impacts of elections on the market. So I am going to go ahead and bring Rocky back on. So Rocky, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Very good information and things are moving in the right direction. So that's good to see. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit, just a few minutes on the impact of elections on the markets. It's a, it's a call that uh, comes into the office once in a while and people are wondering, hey, what actually happens to the stock market during election cycles? And we're gonna talk just a little bit about the historical perspective. I'll get out of the way here so you can see the whole title, but let's look at some questions. Which political party has been better for investors? Okay, we've got an election coming up here and uh, could be a change in the White House, but let's look at the data, historical data. So what this uh, picture is showing since 1933, it is showing the presidencies and whether it was a Democratic presidency in blue or a Republican presidency in red and what has happened to the S&P since 1933. And I think it's pretty easy to see that you got pretty much a straight line. There's very, uh, nothing substantial that says, hey, there was a period when a Democrat or a Republican was in the White House that there wasn't growth in the market. In fact, in 1933, if you had invested $1,000 in the S&P, you would be worth over $10 million gross growth in 2018. That is an amazing number. So 
U.S. stocks have trended up regardless of whether a Democrat or Republican won the White House. What typically happens to the stock market during an election year? Okay, that's a big concern. So what we've got here is a chart that goes from January, the beginning of uh, the year of an election year, through May of the following year. So giving us about an 18-month perspective. Um, when you look at these two lines, the dark blue is non-election years, and the light blue is what has historically happened during election years. So these are averages since 1932 of what the stock market has done month by month, whether it's an election year or non-election year. If you notice, in May through September, there's a big, big difference whether it's an election year or not election year. The light blue line drops significantly going into the summer during an election year. During a non-election year, it tends to go up in the second quarter into the summer. And then, however, it comes back in the election year. And by September, as we get closer to the election day, you'll notice the light blue line is coming down again signaling another correction. So literally, historically, there are a couple of major corrections in the market in an election year, which is different than a non-election year, which is the dark blue line above it. So you can see that, hey, we're in an election year, and we had COVID, and we had a market correction, right? We had a major drop in the market, but the market did come back throughout the summer. And what are we experiencing now in September? We're starting to experience another correction. So it seems to be following this pattern. But if you look at the lines moving forward, there's definitely an upward trend in after the election day moving forward historically. So we seem to be following at least into September this kind of a pattern. What sectors have done best in election years? You may be thinking, well, you know, tech has really boomed in the summer and now it's correcting again. But if we look at 2016, let's go back to the last election and let's look at healthcare, the healthcare sector versus the, the overall S&P. The healthcare is the blue line and the S&P in general is the gray line. And you can see in the first shaded area titled the 2016 election cycle that the healthcare actually was outperforming the S&P until the election cycle. And then there was a major correction that had taken place. Why? Because there was a lot of talk about policies and proposals during the election campaign, and it was going to impact the healthcare industry, right? But as we got through that, look what happened. The healthcare continued to rise with the S&P. So what is the point of this chart? In 2016, going into the election, we saw buying opportunities in certain sectors because they were being impacted in the short term by uh, the, the uh, policies that were being proposed by the candidates. However, if you would have bought the healthcare sector right before the election, you'd have seen huge growth from 2016 through now. And now we're entering that cycle again. And the question is, what are the money managers doing? And that's what I stated up front, was that we're selectively looking for those appropriate valuations, those opportunities. We've got a market correction taking place now. We've kind of seemed to enter that. And what are the things that we should be buying at a lower price? And that is going on. What mistakes do investors often make in election years? This chart is tracking basically the four years of a term of a president. So year one of the presidency, year two, year three, and year four. That's what's along the bottom of the graph. And then the blue bar represents funds going into the equity markets. So the inflows of money into the equity markets. So if you look at year one, equity funds increased significantly in the first year of a presidency. Money funds, not so much, which is the greenish blue bar. Year two, same thing. Equity funds, money's flowing into equities, not so much into money market funds. But look what happens in years three and four. 
investors get concerned investors are maybe a little bit skittish of investing in the market because they don't know what's going to come and you see equity flows decrease and money market flows increase substantially what does that mean money's coming out of the market that's another reason that we kind of see this double dip taking place is that funds tend to flow out of equity markets as investors get concerned the big question is should that be happening? And what we've done here is looked at what would have been the best ways maybe to invest in election years. And here's three hypothetical $10,000 investment strategies during an election cycle. And again, this is all historic data based off of what's happened in the past. So if you were fully invested, the dark blue is saying, if I was fully invested on January 1 of an election year, four years later, my $10,000 investment would grow to 15,866 historically. The light blue bar is what if I was contributing to my 401k and I couldn't put all in at the beginning of the year, but I could put in X amount of dollars every month for the $1,000 a month for the first 10 months starting in January. That also $10,000 would grow to 15,729. Not quite as good as the initial upfront investment, but remember I said election years are volatile years. So sometimes you're putting in when the market's up. Sometimes you're putting in with the market down. So your dollar cost averaging, and that's very effective to get that rate of return. Okay. And then the kind of reddish brown bar sitting on the sidelines. I took my $10,000, put it in a money market, and waited to next year and put it in the market. And you can see there was a significant less amount of money made waiting one year, even though we know there's volatility in an election year. And then when you look at the circles on the right side of this chart, you see the best outcome and the worst outcome. So for the person that put all the money in up front, 14 out of 22 times, that was the best way to invest during that presidency. Six out of 22 times, it was the worst way to invest. Okay, and then for the consistent, the 401k contributor, five of the 22 cycles, that strategy worked the best. But conversely, it was never the worst way to invest during that presidency for four years. And finally, if you stayed in cash, you were wrong 16 out of 22 times by doing that. So it was only the best strategy, three out of the 22 presidency cycles that were being uh, studied here. So the point is, we know it's volatile, but you will come out ahead, historically speaking, by just staying in the market. So what have we learned about elections and markets? U.S. stocks have trended up regardless of whether there's a Republican or Democrat in the White House. A $1,000 investment in the S&P index when FDR became president in 1933 would have been worth over $14 million through uh, September of 2020, August of 2020. Primary season tends to be vol volatile, but markets have bounced back strongly afterward. So we've seen that in the charts. Investors often get nervous and move to cash during election years. Net asset flows into money, money market funds have been more than three times higher in election years than non-election years. However, staying on the sidelines has rarely paid off. Remember, only three out of the 22 presidency cycles that were studied. It's time in the market, not timing in the market, that matters the most. In fact, stocks have had negative returns in only two of the last 20 elections, and that was the year 2000 and the year 2008, and both declines were largely attributed to asset price bubbles rather than politics. And we remember the dot-com bubble and we remember the financial crisis uh, in 2007 and 2008. So another thing is that, and the, and the other charts I showed kind of represented this too, that market performance often reverses after an election. And we wanted to slice that information a little differently. And what this is showing, since we have a Republican in office now, what happens when the incumbent wins or loses. So the first two bars represent the incumbent party wins. 
And the black is what happened to the market in the election year and what happened the year after. So you can see that historically when the incumbent wins, whether Democrat or Republican, um, the market is up after the election. In uh, second section, with the incumbent party losing, that the market tends to go down in that election year, but rebounds fairly strongly the following year. Okay, the third set, incumbent Republican wins. So the year of the election tends to be a very strong year for the market and still solid growth in the following year. And if the incumbent Republican loses, the market tends to go down in the election year, but rebounds very strong in the following year. So again, overall, do markets get impacted by elections? Yes. Does the investor that is in it for the long term lose as a result of staying invested? No, you generally come out ahead. And with that, I'm going to bring Dan back on. And Dan, you can bring us up to speed on where we're at with the market currently. All right, very good. Good job, a lot of good information there, Rocky, very good. Uh, so let's go ahead and move forward on the market. So where are we? Well, let's first talk about the current GDP. GDP is a real indicator of any kind of economic activity. So when the GDP goes down, it's reflective of we've got a problem in the economy. When the GDP goes up, it, it shows that, hey, the, the economy is getting more healthy. So what we found this week is that the GDP actually went up from last week from a 31.7 estimate to a 32 estimate. Now, that may not seem like much, but every point makes a huge difference in dollars. So the GDP is going in the right direction, uh, and, and it looks like we're going to have a pretty solid quarter for Q3. Uh, we've, you've seen this uh, chart before. We show it really every time we have the market report because it gives you an idea from the price earnings ratio, where does the market stand? How's the health of the market? And the price earnings ratio is currently moving up and it has been quite frankly over the last few months. But we now topped over 29. So we're at 29.5. Uh, what does that mean? It means that a lot of the market's a bit overvalued. Uh, I would also say, and, and look at look at things this way, as, as we were looking at the overall market, the reality is the market is, is pushing higher, but is every sector moving higher? And at the end of the day, the answer is no. Uh, you can tell that the tech stocks are moving high. Anything that's related to doing things at home, especially business, uh, is actually moving upward. Uh, more of your brick and mortar type companies are having a much tougher time. So there is a huge dichotomy between the real successful companies out there and the ones that are just having a bit of a hard time at this stage. One of the reasons it's so important to get the economy moving forward and opening up again. So that being said, let's take a look at uh, some of the other things that we've got going here with the markets. And I'm gonna focus a little bit on the dividend stocks out there. A lot of people uh, invest for the dividends and they're wondering why you know some parts of their portfolio are up while other parts of the portfolio are down. Well, when you're looking at this, it's really kind of interesting because the high dividend sectors, which is the gold bars, are actually not performing all that well. Uh, as you can see, the high dividend index is actually down about 19% compared to the S&P 500. Now, keep in mind also, high dividend stocks are going to run really four, five, and six percent dividends on them, uh, whereas your typical S&P is going to have an average of two percent dividends. But right now, the dividend stocks, the high yield dividends are just not performing well, 
And the interesting thing is that they normally do well in recessions. Uh, so it, there's a bit of a dichotomy going on right there. The lower yield uh, yielding dividend stocks tend to be a lot more volatile, kind of like your technology sector and discretionary. So it, it's just interesting. This is why it's so important to be a tactical manager to be able to move in and out of different sectors to try to capitalize on that which is moving forward. Now, none of the money managers are gonna be perfect, but they're certainly working well to gain as much as they can in the safest manner possible. So that's your high dividend. Now, what could put pressure on the markets? Well, the reality is, is all you have to do is look at the newspaper. So the media's got a, a whirlwind of different ideas that could create a downturn on the market. And certainly uh, any one of these can create havoc or actually add to uh, the combination of events that will drop the market. But the reality is, you know, when, when you ask the question, should investors be concerned about a market sell-off? Well, I, the answer is yes and no. Uh, so think of it this way. After five months of relatively steady advances, the U.S. equities have experienced their first, really first sign of kind of uh, a hiccup. Uh, and, and we'll talk about where we are in the market today. But when you think about the overall concerns that we have in the market, right now there's a little bit more skepticism. Uh, why? Because there's a question as to whether we're actually going to get another stimulus package before the election. Uh, we're not sure. It, it, the two sides don't seem to be coming together as well as they should for the people. Um, and there is signs of slowing progress in the labor markets. And, and if you think about it, the longer we stay closed, the more likely businesses are going to close for good, and that's shifting the labor uh, numbers. So uh, again, very important to get the economy going, but it certainly has shifted the sentiment out there. Now, if you look at this chart, it shows you the bear market bottoms from 1970 to 2020 and the number of pullbacks within the first year of the recovery. And you can see the five to 10% pullbacks are quite frequent when it comes to the first year of a bull recovery. Now, there are uh, times where you have a greater than 10%. And as you look at this chart, it's happened four times during different recoveries. So th the question is, should investors be concerned about market sell-off? Well, like I said, the answer to that is yes or no. Well, why do I say that? Well, it's not a problem if you have a plan. If you don't have a plan, then obviously it's a major concern for you. But the reality is for our clients, we do have a plan for them. So at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the clients understand what the plan is, how we're going to implement it, and when is the right time to implement it. And we have multiple strategies that we're working with with our clients to make sure that we can optimize the amount that they get to keep in their uh, overall circle of wealth. So let's take a look at the economy again. When you're looking at the economy, it's now beginning to look more likely that we're going to have a W-shaped recovery. Uh, it's still likely it could be a U, but it's more likely to be a W. Uh, same thing would hold true with the stock market, more likely to be a W recovery. And again, the longer we stay shut down, the more severe that recovery will be. You don't have to talk to too many economists to, to get that uh, conclusion. So for us, this is not a problem if we have a plan. And again, we do for our clients. Now, if we look at the stock market, in, on September 2nd, we hit a high of 3580 on the S&P 500. Okay, well, that's pretty good because it really kind of bounced higher than it was at the beginning of the year. Uh, but over the last two weeks, we've had a bit of a downturn. So as of yesterday, we were down 9.6%.
So if you're thinking about the plan, the strategies that we have in place, ultimately, we're looking to get into the blue zone here, which would mean that the stock market would have to retrace about 16.2%. And that would be a, a really sweet time to be able to implement many of the strategies that are already set up, but we haven't pulled the trigger on yet. So the, when it comes to the stock market, when it comes to whether people should be worried, no, don't worry. We've got everything uh, set up to be able to activate the different opportunities that are out there. You know, going back to the bolts, we have a strategy. It's not just that picture with a bunch of bolts all over the place. It's uh, it, it can actually be built into a strategy and that's what we have for you. So looking at the strategy playbook again, strategy one, active management, reallocating sectors. And that is what our portfolio managers are doing today. Uh, so they that is a constant run for them. You look at strategy number two, Roth conversions. Well, I wanna make a couple mentions on the Roth conversions. First of all, if we have that downturn that we expect, we would want to implement the Roth conversion at that time. But let's assume that the Congress and the House, they decide to get with the Senate and ultimately come up with a deal. Well, if that happens, what we would expect to see the market do would take a bounce right back up again. Why is that? Well, because the last three that we've done, that has been the mode of operation with the stock market. So what if the market continued to move forward throughout the rest of the year? Do we still do a Roth conversion? Well, the answer to that is yes. Uh, because ultimately we all have a plan to get ourselves in a position where we minimize our long-term taxes. Uh, if Trump stays in office, well, we'll probably have several years of conversions we can do at this low level. If Biden gets in, well, we are already planning that the taxes will be going up. So if that happens, we certainly want to get the Roth conversion done regardless of whether we have a dip because we want to get that money tax-free for our clients. So the Roth conversion is gonna happen this year regardless. It's just a question of when's the opportunity. So we'll be watching that. Um, the next strategy, strategy three, draw and let heal. Uh, this strategy is done with life insurance or home equity lines, or if you just have cash that you have that you can access to allow you to turn off any kind of money that's coming out of the market. And we've already implemented this program for many, many of our clients. Now, the question is, are we going to be paying that back right now? Again, it depends on if this market bounces back up. If it starts bouncing back up because we got another agreement with the government officials to get the stimulus package going, then we'll probably do that in the next month or so. If it continues to come down, we might very well hold off paying back those accounts uh, because, again, we don't want to be drawing money out of the market while the market is going down. It just accentuates the problem. So we're, we're constantly watching that to determine when is the right time for you, and we will certainly let you know. The next one, strategy four, reallocating risk up. Again, that's only going to come on a dip. And same thing with strategy five, buying low. That will come on a dip. So you may say, well, tell me more about the strategies. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to direct you to our YouTube channel. So Daniel Krug and Associates YouTube. If you go there, you're going to see all the different webinars that we've done for our clients. And keep in mind that you can either watch the full view uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes of, of the whole segment, or we have set it up to where you can look at specific sections of each one of those videos. So if you really want to focus on the strategies, um, you can go in there, look at strictly how we presented the strategies to see exactly how they work for you. For most of you, it would just be a refresher, but it allows you to be able to see what's really going on 
uh, relative to your overall strategy. That being said, we're getting to the questions and answers. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Rocky back on. Okay. <clears throat> One of the comments we received was on the FDA stating that they would approve vaccines that are only 50% effective. So I didn't know if you had any comment on that. Or <laughs> well, you know, I, I, actually, I, I don't have a whole lot that, that I can kind of interject on that. Um, I personally, I think I've had a vaccine other than when I was a kid. Um, I think I've had the flu vaccine one time. Other than that, I just try to stay healthy and do, do things as uh, naturally as possible. So I can't really comment on the, on the vaccine and how effective it's going to be but uh, time will certainly prove that out. Right, and you really won't know the effect of right until you start using it and getting some data back. So that's well, in, in, Yeah, and that's, that's interesting you say that, Rocky, because all the vaccines that are out there, no one truly knows how they're gonna work until someone's been using them for a while. So it, it's been that way since the beginning of time. It's no different in this one. Uh, but we'll we'll just have to wait and see how it works out. Um, I'll probably be one of the 50% that don't get the uh, vaccine, but um, that doesn't mean that it's a good or a bad thing. It's just my personal opinion of what I want to do for myself. Uh, I just believe, you know, keep yourself healthy, work out, uh, eat right, uh, watch our weight, uh, make sure that we're not eating a lot of junk food. If we do that, we're going to stay healthier. And that's probably the one thing that can keep us healthy from the virus more than anything else out there, other than obviously, you know, social distancing and the other things that are being done. Well, there you have it from my mouth, that, that, that's for what it's worth. <laughs> okay. um, one other thing I think we could touch on that we didn't in this presentation is there's always questions around income. Uh, where do I get my income from? And we're in a low interest rate environment. So, you know, you talked about dividend stocks being priced fairly low, I mean, that sounds like a buying opportunity to, and a way to generate income with the opportunity for those stock values to rise while paying you dividends. So just kind of recap that again. Yeah, you know. so, so I think that, that, that's a very good point. And something that the money managers have been looking at is, all right, where is the right buying opportunity for those companies that are healthy companies? And they are actually buying into some of those as we speak. So it is part of the overall plan. Now, um, as a whole, do we buy dividend stocks just to get the dividends? Well, you know, we like the returns. There's no, no doubt about that uh, as far as the dividend return, but we do kind of want to be selective as to what type of account do we actually put those dividends in? Because from a tax mitigation standpoint, most of your dividends are going to be ordinary income. Well, we kind of like capital gains more because you pay less tax on capital gains than you do on ordinary income. And at the end of the day, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. And that's the area that we're focused on the most. Um, so that, that's kind of our direction. We do see it going on right now as far as purchasing these high quality dividend stocks in some of the portfolios today though. Well, that's it for questions. And if we could flip back onto the presentation, we can kind of wrap things up here for people. Want to thank everybody for being on. We enjoyed today's presentation. Want to remind you, there's no need to worry. You take care of your family and we will take care of you. So we're ready for 2020, the election and beyond. So everybody have a good day today, and we will see you soon. Bye, All right. everybody. Bye-bye.